Hello, I'm Stanley Waddell, pastor of the Woodland Heights Free Will Baptist Church in Martinsville, Virginia. Thank you for choosing to view our telecast today. We're delighted that you're with us today, and we now take you into our morning worship service. We appreciate your presence today, and thank you for being with us in our service this morning. We we'll also thank our television audience for being with us as we worship the Lord together, and we trust that everyone will receive a wonderful blessing this morning. And now for our call to worship, let's stand together as we sing hymn number two, How Great Thou Art.
remain standing now for the invocation. We'll ask Brother Curtis Bryant, if he will, to lead us in our invocation. Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, we just ask that you'll open our minds and open our hearts, Father, that when we leave this place, we'll have a better understanding of thy holy word. Father, we thank you for each and every home that is represented, and Lord, we just ask that you just be with all of those, Lord, that was unable to come and to share. Be Lord with all of our sick people and our pastor and his wife. Yeah. Just give the doctors the wisdom, Lord, to heal their body if that be thy will. Now, oh God, so just open our minds and open our hearts to where that we can have a better understanding and we'll love you for it. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now let's enjoy our choir as we Sing for you at this time, grace greater than all our sins. Because of that wonderful grace and God forgave us of all of our sins, let's just praise him this morning. Open our hymnals to number 54. We'll ask our choir to stand, our congregation remain seated as we sing together. Let's just praise the Lord. <laughs> let's just praise. Yeah. 
Now we'll ask Catherine, if she will, to come and join us as we sing for you this morning a song entitled, Look for Me at Jesus' Feet. Wait for me at 
Again, we appreciate your presence and being with us today, and we thank you. We have a special treat because of the sickness of our pastor's wife, and he's with her in the hospital this morning. We have, once again, Brother Roger Bevins and his good wife Donna to be with us this weekend. Special to preach for us this morning. We enjoyed so much his message last week, and we look forward to what he's going to bring us from the Word of God this morning. So, Brother Roger, would you come and bless our hearts uh, with the Word of God. Good to be here today. We count it an honor and a privilege each and every time that we do uh, have the opportunity to come. I'm just sorry that it's because of sickness within your family, and especially with Brother Stanley and Sister Sandy. Um, it's a difficult time, especially having gone through with uh, Donna's father, my wife's father. Um, we're just grateful for the news that we've heard and we know that God is good um, in each and everything that he does and we certainly look to him uh, both for healing, we look to him for grace um, in each and everything that comes our way. And so again, I appreciate the opportunity appreciate uh, Brother Stanley having the confidence to call me. I count that a great honor. And so we'd like to talk to you this morning from Luke chapter 16. Um, rich man in hell. It's a subject that is certainly avoided today. Um, I've actually been told not to preach it, um, that it's not welcome in churches, uh, some churches that I've been in. And so, um, you know, you look at the things, and especially with the church as you are today, and I would venture to say most are Christians, if not all. But they are things that uh, God gives us as Christians that we uh, need to be aware of uh, in order that we may deal with those that we come across uh, on a daily basis that can help us in uh, maybe making a difference in somebody's eternity. And I pray every day uh, that God cross my path with someone that I can share this gospel with. And so as we look at this lesson today in Luke 16, um, Noah preached judgment. The brothers already mentioned that this morning. Uh, they mocked him uh, and scorned him and refused to believe. But the flood came in spite of what they believed, what they thought, um, and what they uh, mocked, it still came. Lot preached judgment um, to his generation. Actually, Abraham preached a generation, uh, preached judgment to a generation, and Lot was included. Um, and through that, he was mocked, uh, scorned, and Lot, uh, the nephew, had to be led out of Sodom as judgment fell. Daniel warned of judgment um, in Daniel's day, and yet they took the objects, the holy objects, uh, that had been uh, taken out of Israel's um, worship center and taken into Babylon and through a party. And all know the story uh, through that party 
uh, there suddenly came a handwriting on the wall um, that um, Belchazar had been found wanting and judgment fail. Even, uh, I've done some research in that, even while uh, the writing was being wrote on the wall, even while the party was going on, there was an army that was digging under uh, the uh, wall uh, and all of a sudden judgment failed. No matter what we believe, no matter what we want to think uh, about the day that is coming before us, every Christian knows, and everybody in this house I know, that knows the word of God at all, knows that there is coming a day that people are going to reckon uh, with their lifestyle, with their belief system. We're going to have to give an account before a holy God. I'm glad that each and every one of us that know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior have already reckoned that before him. Uh, by taking our sins uh, to a cross, that Christ died to make men free. I'm glad that's done. So now, if you won't call it judgment, and I guess in a sense it is, we've got the judgment seat of Christ, but it's not going to judge our sins. It will judge our works. And they are works that we do that I don't think anybody is naive enough to believe that some of these works just fail. You know, I look back across 40 plus years of ministry and there's so many things, so many ideas uh, that I thought were good at the time have just come to um, nothing. And yet, I know that there is some uh, that have been worthy and will survive the judgment seat of Christ and one day I will receive praise of him. That is something that is just precious to look at. But as we look this morning in Luke 16, uh, verse 19 through verse 29, and I'm going to read all of them, uh, it just tells you where that we're at uh, as we look at this. In uh, verse 19, it says, there was. Now, some people have said that this was one of Christ's uh, ramblings, uh, this is just a parable, whatever. But it's not presented as a parable. It is presented as something that is of absolute certainty. There was a certain rich man uh, and was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared. And that word fared means that he was in a great frame of mind. Uh, no worries. There was nothing in uh, his lifestyle. There was nothing in his thought pattern that was any great concern to him because he was in a frame of mind that made him joyful as he came out. And the Bible went on to say, fared sumptuously. And that word sumptuously means that uh, he was... Brilliant. He was clothed in brilliant clothing. Uh, you wouldn't mistake him. It's kind of like uh, Donna's car. You know, in a parking lot, you won't miss it uh, when you out, out there in a parking lot. Uh, you can come out of the mall or wherever it is that you're at, and that sets, you know. This man stood out in a crowd. Uh, he had the means to stand out in a crowd. And so he fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid. And that word laid was interesting. Uh, it's not in the sense of carefully laid. He wasn't brought out and with gentleness placed down at the rich man's gate. And he's there uh, in hopes of gathering food and droppings of whatever fell from the rich man's table, but he was not placed there in gentleness as we might do with someone that is less fortunate 
and especially by the fact that he was brought, it leads you to believe that he was a handicapped in some manner, uh, maybe old, I don't know, the Bible doesn't reckon with that, but in the sense that he was laid, uh, that word says that he was thrown violently, which carries the idea that he was just pitched off of a cart, maybe a donkey, I don't know. Uh, but he certainly was not the favorite man of the day, and he was not going to be, uh, uh, win the best man of the year. But in looking at this man, this rich man, I want you to notice some things in uh, verse 24. Verse 24 leads us to believe that he was a religious man. But I want you to understand something. Religion uh, gets us absolutely no worse. And if we're not careful with our religious ways, it can lead us right into hell. <clears throat> this man was religious. Look at verse 24. He prayed for mercy, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Secondly, verse 24, he prayed for water. <clears throat> In verse 28, he prayed for his five brothers. So the man knew something about prayer. He knew something about how that prayer worked and what he wanted out of that prayer, even as we do. You have prayed fervently for Sister Sandy. And God, to this point, has honored your prayers in bringing her out of a state um, of um, uh, being unconscious or whatever it may be, have brought her back to where she is breathing on her own. And this man knew something about prayer or the power that was in prayer. He believed. But believing and even praying, I know folks that pray uh, that will curse a blue streak as they're praying. Use the Lord's name in vain. They have no concern about those things. This man uh, wanted, uh, he wanted mercy for himself. But I want you to notice something about this rich man. Um, he, uh, the scripture leads you to believe that he was very, very selfish. He didn't give the crumbs. He wasn't concerned about the condition of Lazarus. He, um, paid no attention to the circumstances that surrounded it. And I want you to notice that in hell, as he lifts up his eyes, he's still uh, the person that he was in life. Because look at his prayer. Mercy for himself. Water for himself. Uh, five brothers' prayer for his five brothers. That's for himself because he doesn't want the faith of his five brothers, and whatever that we are in life, no matter what it may be, if our destiny is eternal hell, we're going to wake up in hell with the characteristics that we had in life. They're not going to change. We think, well, hell is going to, you know, uh, do all of these things. No, it's not going to do those things. I'm telling you what it's going to do. It's just going to amp them up because we become more set. The idea of being uh, selfish is just going to uh, go even deeper and deeper and deeper. The man knew how to pray. He knew the scriptures. He called Moses by name. He named the prophets by record. But he still went to hell. Verse 19 uh, reminds us uh, in the fact that he was a rich man clothed in purple imported from Egypt. The best. Clothed in fine linen was imported from Syria. There was none better. Clothed in the best that money could buy, but a heart as dark as hell itself. And there's something to be gained as we look on this individual. Man looks on the outside. 
If somebody had looked at this rich man, they would have talked about what a good man he was. When we see people that, uh, you know, attract our eye, the automatic assumption is that they are good in them. When we see somebody that is ill-dressed, the automatic assumption is the worst. Man looks on the outside. But as this man understood, God was not looking outside. God was looking in. There was no better dressed man of his day. Probably no better man uh, in his speech patterns. No better. But it didn't mean an iota if our destiny is hell. He was in a state of ruin. If you look at verse 23, um, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. That very night, someone unexpected. Can you think about this? That very night, and there's no doubt in my mind that there was plans in that man's mind for the next day. This is what I'm going to do. A lot of us write down uh, what we're going to do the next day. But that very night, unexpectedly, God called him. Someone unexpected became the proud owner of a castle or a home. The proud owner of the wealth may have been a son, could have been a daughter. It may have been someone that was unknown. Uh, the Bible doesn't talk about those things. But somebody unexpectedly became uh, the owner of all that this man had in life. And all of those things that he looked down and said, this is what I've done. This is what I have done. This is what I have done. This is what I have gained. I've got all of this. And God reminds us, no. The only thing that we have is a living soul that is going to give record someday to that holy God who gave it in the first place. Verse 22 talks about his untimely death. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried. Now the idea there is carried gently, favorably. If you could, if you could just, if God would just withdraw the scales that are over our eyes when the death of one of his saints is picked by the angel's and carried into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, it is nothing compared to how Lazarus was laid at the gate that day. Believe you me, it's going to be the ride. It's going to be the journey. It's going to be... Uh, the grandest thing that is ever going to take place is when our eyes close in death and those death angels may even be the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know. I was called to a home. Uh, they called me out of Bible study. A lady was dying. They called me to her home. And her husband was standing um, at the foot of the bed. My assistant pastor was already there. He had gone. Uh, in my place, but they wanted me there. And so when I got there, we were very quiet at a whisper, talking at the foot of her bed, and she raised up out of that bed and said, shh, I need to hear what they are saying, and pointed to a window. Now, I don't know what that lady saw, but I know one thing, that lady saw something. Because she laid back down. She took one long breath, and away she went. And I am beyond certain that a holy God with his angels were there to meet her, and she wanted to hear without any misunderstanding of what they were saying because she was going on a journey. And she wasn't coming back. When Lazarus was carried to Abraham's bosom, 
was the right of his life. He sure wouldn't like anything that he'd been accustomed to as they would bring him and cast him at that gate every day for every how long the man had suffered. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. Uh, probably for a length of time. It probably was enough that the rich man, that it was indelibly printed in, uh, in the innermost part of his mind because in hell, that's the first thing that he's beginning to be concerned of. He wanted that beggar that he had nothing to do with to go uh, to his five brethren and warn them not to come uh, to this awful place of torment. His untimely death, verse 22, his death was sudden. As many of our deaths are. I had a first cousin uh, down at um, Withful uh, just a few weeks ago. Had been down to our family reunion. And I heard her daughter stopped in at um, the uh, station there. Um, Sheets, I think it was. She told her daughter to go get us two fountain drinks and I'll pump the gas. And when she came back out, her mom was lying on the ground. They were giving her CPR and they never got a heartbeat. She just was away. Gone. No suffering. Wasn't any sadness in the sense of her departing. It was just a moment. There was a breath. And then away we go. Our deaths sometimes are unplanned. It's sudden. It's unforeseen. I'm sure that Anna had no idea that that day she was going to meet her maker. But she was ready. She knew him. She had made plans a long time ago. And she lived the life that said absent from the body, present with the Lord. Our death is unplanned. Um, Remember that scripture tells us this one thing about us, and it comes from James chapter 4, verse 14, that our life is just like a vapor. It appears, you may look at it for a moment, and then suddenly it's gone. His death, as untimely as it was, still brought about in an instant separation from his earthly home. But here's the saddest part. You know, we work a lifetime. We have homes. We enjoy those homes. But that's not the loss. When our eyes close in death, that's the least thing going to be on our mind because the next moment we're going to face our Creator and His loss in losing His earthly home. He lost all hope of gaining an eternal home. Separated forever. His death, as unexpected and sobering as it was, took hell to open up his mind of things that could be important to him. I get thirsty sometimes, but I'll be honest with you, I take water for granted. You know, Sometimes I just absentmindedly I drink. But I'm telling you what, but if water's going to be on the mind, is on the mind of every man uh, and woman that has ever departed this life and made hell their home. Uh, water's on their mind. And not a lot. Just dip the tip to cool my tongue that is tormented in this flame. His distress, look at verse 24 through verse 31. Not going to read it, just uh, putting you into uh, the area where we're looking at. Verse 24, uh, we see the burning. It's not just your average burning. Now, Guiana, um, the uh, trash pit of Israel that hell is likened to the fire uh, burned every day. I've seen fires that burn every day, every day, every day. Um, 
and trash is thrown in it, sometimes uh, bodies, animal bodies, and so on. But this fire is unquenchable. Our fires can be put out, but the fires of eternal hell will range forever and ever. The burden, verse 28, please go tell my brothers. Folks here, this is what we're doing today. I was uh, talking in a Bible study uh, last year, uh, and I was talking about those things that are going to happen uh, during tribulation period. Uh, and the question was asked, well, where are we going to be? I said, we're going to be safe home. And this lady spoke up and said, then why do we need to know anything about uh, tribulation? I said, my children or my grandchildren or my great-grandchildren or great, 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 who knows how long, when uh, as long as Christ Terrace is coming, there's going to be an offspring that are going to miss, uh, they're going to miss the rapture, and they're going to be thrown in to the most miserable time that man will ever spend on the face of this earth. Because the Bible says that it is a time that has never been, and it's a time that is ever uh, going to be again. And I said by uh, better than a good chance, some of my offspring, those that have come from Don and I somewhere down the road are not paying attention. And lo and behold, it wasn't two weeks until my sister called her and told her that my granddaughter and my grandson knew absolutely nothing about tribulation. And it burned indelibly in my heart that, hey, I need to be even more about the Father's business because this day's coming. It's approaching. Man, you look around. Uh, the Bible says earthquakes in divers places. California just had a serious, too serious earthquake. And we're seeing things that have never been. They're talking about weather patterns that have never been on this earth before. I believe the Lord's soon coming. And so it behooves every one of us as Christians because somebody that we know or somebody that is near kin uh, are going to be like the rich man. They're going to lift their eyes in hell. And listen, folks, it's too late. Now is the time that you and I have the opportunity to warn them. That's what Christ told us. Warn them to flee the wrath to come. Tell them about the good news. We have the opportunity. We look at this right here and we say, thank you, God, that you've given me a clear unmistakable picture of what is out there and I need to be about the Father's business and let me close the banishment verse 30 and 31 uh, what was he banished from first of all from love there is no love in hell I hear people tell, I have friends that will tell me, oh, I'll have plenty of company. You won't know your next door neighbor. You won't even be aware because there's going to be so much torment. Just think about whenever you're in serious pain, you don't think about anybody else. You don't have time. You're in such intense pain that all you're doing is concentrating, trying to get rid of that pain. Won't even know that anyone's near. Banished from light. Matthew chapter 25 and chapter 8, uh, verse 12, talks about outer darkness where there is an absence of light. In the middle of absolute torment and punishment. And then last but not least, an absence of liberty. We won't be able to do the things that we once done. Now is the day of salvation. Right now is the accepted time. We have the opportunity. And this old book points the way to a glorious get-together someday. I'm telling you, it's in the presence of love. It'll be in the presence of light. And it'll be in the presence of absolute liberty 
to be able to worship our Lord the way that our hearts have told us that we need to do. May God bless you, is my prayer. Open our hymnals to number 258. If there's anyone here this morning that's heard this message and their heart is not right with the Lord and he's told you that, we need to come to the altar this morning and give our hearts to the Lord. Miss this place called hell where the rich man went and go to this place called heaven where Lazarus went. So may this day be a day of salvation to those that don't know the Lord. Shall we stand together, 258. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> oh, soul, are you with appreciate that wonderful message this morning. We thank you all that have come to be with us in uh, church today, and we trust that God will bless you this afternoon, and if it be uh, so that you can, we invite you to come back and be with us at 6 o'clock in our service tonight. So for our closing, let's turn to hymn number 344. And we'll sing the first verse of the family of God. 344. <clears throat> I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. As we travel this side, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. You will notice we say brother and sister around here. It's because we're a family and these folks are so near. When one has a heartache, we all share the tears and rejoice in its victory in this family so dear. I'm so glad. travel this side, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful afternoon. We look forward to seeing you in our presence in the service tonight. Thank you for viewing our program today, and I trust that it's been a blessing to you and your family. If this program has been a blessing to you, please drop us a note 
at Woodland Heights Free Will Baptist Church, 1995 Old Chatham Road, here in Martinsville, Virginia, 24112. Or better yet, why don't you come and visit with us at one of our services? Thank you, and may God bless you. Woodland Heights Free Will Baptist Church is located in 1995 Old Chatham Road in Martinsville. Service time, Sunday school at 10 a.m., Sunday morning worship at 11 a.m., Sunday evening service at 6 p.m., and Wednesday evening service at 7 p.m. Visit us on the web at woodlandheightsfwb.org. The pastor is Stanley Waddell. No part of this broadcast may be reproduced in any form or by any means without the prior written permission of Woodland Heights Free Will Baptist Church. Any broadcast, reproduction, or other use of the pictures and accounts of this program without the express written consent of Woodland Heights Free Will Baptist Church is prohibited.